Okay, well, good evening, uh, everybody, and all those who might be viewing this online later on. Welcome to uh, tonight's presentation by Reasonable Faith Adelaide. My name is Jeff Russell, and I'm chairing the event tonight. And I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Schroeder, our speaker for tonight. Brian is a long standing member of Reasonable Faith Adelaide and has uh, presented on many occasions over several years. Uh, tonight, his subject is Paul versus James. That's with reference to uh, two very significant New Testament characters, the Apostle Paul and, um, and James, one of the authors of the New Testament, along with Paul. And his subject is uh, about their Gospels. Is there really a difference? So now, Brian, it's over to you. Thank you. It is often claimed that our Christianity comes from Paul, not from Jesus, that Paul took it over and molded it in his own image. Now, I addressed this previously at a reasonable faith event a couple of years ago, comparing Paul and Jesus and found no conflict, only full agreement, and that there is one gospel, only one, of Jesus Christ. However, there is still one aspect that still stands out. The stark contrast between Paul and James on the place of faith and works. And while this appears to be a major conflict that critics like to point out and use to try and discredit Christianity, Christians also have problems with it. The great reformer Martin Luther is famously quoted as calling James an epistle of straw. So what are we to make of it? First though, to get a better understanding of the background and of what is behind what we read, it will help to first get a picture of the backgrounds of the respective authors, Paul and James, and their relationship. Paul, or Saul as he was known at the time, was a Jew of the Israelite tribe of Benjamin. He was born roughly about 5 BC in the city of Tarsus. Yeah, Tarsus is this city over on the right here, uh, in what is now southeastern Turkey. It was the capital of the Roman province of Cilicia, and it even rivaled Athens and Alexandria so far as its schools of learning were concerned. Julius Caesar was so impressed by Tarsus that he made it tax exempt and lavished further favours on the city. In gratitude, Tarsus renamed itself Juliopolis. Caesar also rewarded the Jews of the region and by extension, all Jews who would eventually live under Roman rule. It gave them freedom to practice their religion in thanks for their support during his struggles with Pompeii. His decree, most likely from 47 BC, was upheld by Augustus Caesar and the emperors who succeeded him. Now, Paul's father was a Pharisee, very strict in his, inherit, in his adherence to the gospel of, to the God of Israel and to the Jewish law. And Paul was brought up to be the same and more so. His early training was in Tarsus. It was a very Jewish training, but he was also educated in the wisdom and learning of the Greeks using the schools that were there. But his later education was in Jerusalem under the rabbi Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the leading Pharisee of his time. And according to the New World Encyclopedia, even though few of his actual teachings have been preserved, Gamaliel I held a reputation as one of the greatest teachers in the annals of Judaism. And Paul was one of his students. Thus, Paul was given a solid understanding of the Greek, their philosophers and their wisdom, and the best possible training in Judaism and the scriptures, that is our Old Testament. He was very dedicated, totally committed, a Pharisee of the highest order, with his future in Jerusalem, uh, in Judaism, mapped out. So deeply invested was he in the Jewish law and in the mission of the Pharisees, that he so lived that none of those looking on could find any basis to accuse him of wrong or sin. He alone knew of and struggled with his failures. He was the arch Hebrew of his time, as he himself said effectively in Philippians chapter 3. Now, Paul, as I said, was a Pharisee. And the Pharisees were primarily not a political party, but a society of scholars and pietists. They enjoyed a large popular following, 
And in the New Testament, they appear as spokesmen for the majority of the population. About 100 BC, a long struggle ensued as the Pharisees tried to democratize the Jewish religion and remove it from the control of the temple priests. The Pharisees asserted that God could and should be worshipped even away from the temple and outside Jerusalem. To the Pharisees, worship consisted not in bloody sacrifices, the practice of the temple priests, but in prayer in the study of God's law. Hence, the Pharisees fostered the synagogue as an institution of religious worship outside and separate from the temple. The synagogue may thus be considered a Pharisaic institution since the Pharisees developed it, raised it to high eminence and gave it a central place in Jewish life. The Pharisee or separatist party emerged largely out of the group of scribes and sages. The term Pharisee comes from the Hebrew and Aramaic parush or parushi, which means one who is separated. It may refer to their separation from Gentiles, sources of ritual impurity, or from irreligious Jews. The Pharisees, among other Jewish sects, were active from the middle of the second century BC until the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Josephus first mentions them in connection with Jonathan, the successor of Judas Maccabeus. One of the factors that distinguished the Pharisees from other groups prior to the destruction of the temple was their belief that all Jews had to observe the purity laws, which applied to the temple service, outside the temple. The major difference, however, was the continued adherence of the Pharisees to the laws and traditions of the Jewish people in the face of assimilation. As Josephus noted, the Pharisees were considered the most expert and accurate expositors of Jewish law. Now, time and again, through the history of Israel and Judah, the people had abandoned the law and the covenant that God had given them and turned their backs on God. And this always led to trouble and judgment until finally the nation was destroyed, their temple demolished, people deported. And after the restoration, there was the ongoing probability that what had been before would be again. And the next time there would be no restoration, but only annihilation of their nation. So eventually those who were pious, who were committed to God, to his covenant, to his law, gave themselves to study it constantly, to live it and to teach it, to make and keep the nation and people pure and following the God of Israel wholeheartedly forever. Anything that served to draw the people away from this was to be resisted with all force. And we read in the book of Acts how <clears throat> that meant something special to Paul and he lived that out. An unfortunate corollary of this was that they then tended to become inordinately enamored with their own righteousness. And they regarded themselves, their opinions, their ways, their lives way too highly. Thus making it very hard to see or comprehend anything outside their blinkered perspective and to imagine that there could be truth or knowledge outside their walled garden. And despite the impression we get from the Gospels, the Pharisees were not all bad. Consider Jesus' words in Matthew 5.20 where he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Or in other words, Jesus was holding up the Pharisees as the epitome of human righteousness. Now, he said it wasn't good enough, but nevertheless, he was showing them up as the best that there is. In Acts 15, it says, but some believers from the party of the Pharisees stood up and declared, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. And that is a big subject, which we will come to a little bit later in tonight's talk. But the point here is that some of the Pharisees believed in Jesus and embraced the gospel. They were part of the church. And then towards the end of the book of Acts, it says, Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. It is because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. After many years of preaching and writing the gospel, Paul was perfectly happy to be known as a Pharisee. His Pharisaic background was a permanent part of who he was and how he thought.
The James who wrote the, the epistle or letter called James in our Bibles is generally believed to be the same James who we read about in the book of Acts. For example, in chapter 12, verse 7, uh, Peter motioned with his hand for silence, and he described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Send word to James and to the brothers, he said, and he left for another place. So at that point, it's obvious that James is a significant person. Um, and chapter 21 of Acts, the next day Paul went in with us to see James and all the elders were present. 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul writes that then he, that is the resurrected Jesus, appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And in Galatians, he writes, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And so through all of that, James is a significant person. And in the second to last book in the New Testament, the book of Jude, he starts off introducing himself as a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James to those who are called, loved by God the Father and kept in Jesus Christ. So clearly this James, whoever he is, is a significant person uh, to the early church. And note particularly Galatians 1.19, where James is referred to as the Lord's brother. There has been much discussion as to the identity of this James. Clearly he is not the son of Zebedee and brother of John, since that James was executed by Herod Agrippa reasonably early on, as described in Acts chapter 12. Another suggestion has been James, the son of Alphaeus, another one of Jesus' 12 disciples. But that is considered so unlikely that even those proposing it don't really think it's likely. The general and normal assumption is that this is the James mentioned in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, one of the four brothers of Jesus. And note in this verse that Judas or Jude is also mentioned as one of Jesus' brothers and hence brother of James. Given that general consensus, it is interesting to compare the attitude of Jesus' brothers in the gospels uh, with what we read later in the Acts and the epistles. There was clearly a major change of understanding that went on there. All of that said, there are differences of opinion as to who James and his brothers and sisters were. The obvious implication from a plain reading of the New Testament is that they were the children of Joseph and Mary, all born after Jesus. However, Catholic and Orthodox Christians believe that it is necessary to maintain that Mary was eternally a virgin and never consummated her marriage to, Jake, to Joseph. Thus, these other children must have a different origin from their perspective. And suggestions are that they're possibly children of Joseph from a former marriage, or that children of Mary's sister Mary, although why the parents would name two daughters Mary is never adequately explained, or cousins in some other way, as in like second cousins or some other connection along that line. Interestingly though, he is sometimes referred to in Eastern Christianity as Jacobos ha Adelphotheos, meaning James, the brother of God. And that is rather similar terminology, if you think about it, to how they refer to Mary in later times as the mother of God. Now, whatever we, we may actually think of that terminology, it still implies a connection that both James and Jesus were children of Mary. In the Gospels, Jesus' brothers, including James, are described as not believing him. For example, in John chapter 7, it says, The Jewish Feast of Tabernacles was near. So Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, so that your disciples there may see the works you are doing. For no one who wants to be known publicly acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Or in Mark chapter 3, it says, When his family heard about this, they went out to take custody of him, saying, he is out of his mind. However, according to Paul, one of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances was specifically to James. And after his ascension, Acts 1.14 lists the brothers 
as being together with the apostles, as we can see here in the yellow. Now, in the book of Acts, at the beginning, Peter is clearly the leader of the church. But following the death of Stephen and the persecution under Saul, there seems to have been a lot of movement by many, including the apostles. So much so that after James, son of Zebedee's execution and Peter's miraculous escape, James appears to already be the leader, as we read in Acts 12, 17. And every subsequent reference to James pictures him as the head of the church. He is also described by Paul as a pillar of the church in Galatians 2, 9. In particular, when we get to the first church council in Jerusalem, James is clearly the leader and the final decision a communique was made by him. Thus, the position taken by James on any subject would be significant. According to Hegesippus, after the apostles, James, the brother of the Lord, surnamed the just, was made head of the church at Jerusalem. Many indeed are called James. This one was holy from his mother's womb. He drank neither wine nor strong drink, ate no flesh, never shaved or anointed himself with ointment or bathed. He alone had the privilege of entering the Holy of Holies, since indeed he did not use wool investments, but linen, and went alone into the temple and prayed in behalf of the people, insomuch that his knees were reputed to have acquired the hardness of camel's knees. Now there are some question marks over some of what Hegesippus says, including the idea that he was a Nazarite from birth, but it does reflect a very strong early tradition and clearly tells us that James was very devout and highly respected by everyone. He was commonly known as James the Just for a reason. Eusebius, while quoting Josephus' account, also records otherwise lost passages from Hegesippus and Clement of Alexandria. Hegesippus' account varies somewhat from what Josephus reports and may have been an attempt to reconcile the various accounts by combining them. According to Hegesippus, the scribes and Pharisees came to James for help in putting down Christian beliefs. The record says, they came therefore in a body to James and said, we entreat you, restrain the people, for they are gone astray in their opinions about Jesus, as if he were the Christ. We entreat thee to persuade all who have come hither for the day of the Passover concerning Jesus. For we all listen to your persuasion, since we, as well as all the people, bear you testimony that you are just and show partiality to none. Therefore persuade the people not to entertain erroneous opinions concerning Jesus. For all the people, and we also listen to your persuasion. Take your stand then on the summit of the temple, that from that elevated spot you may be clearly seen, and your words may be plainly audible to all the people. For in order to attend the Passover, all the tribes have congregated hither, and some of the Gentiles also. To the scribes and Pharisees' dismay, James boldly testified that Christ himself sits in heaven at the right hand of the great power, and shall come on the clouds of heaven. The scribes and Pharisees then said to themselves, We have not done well in procuring this testimony to Jesus, but let us go up and throw him down, that they may be afraid and not believe him. Accordingly, the scribes and Pharisees threw down the just man and began to stone him, for he was not killed by the fall. But he turned and kneeled down and said, I beseech you, Lord God, our Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And while they were thus stoning him to death, one of the priests, the son of Rechab, the son of Rechabim, to whom testimony is borne by Jeremiah the prophet, began to cry aloud, saying, Cease! What are you doing? The just man is praying for us. But one among them, one of the fullers, took the staff with which he was accustomed to wring out the garments he died, and hurled it at the head of the just man. And so he suffered martyrdom, and they buried him on the spot, and the pillar erected to his memory still remains close by the temple. This man was a true witness to both Jews and Greeks that Jesus is the Christ. And the Jewish historian Josephus later suggested that the horrors of the siege and destruction of Jerusalem were as punishment for this treatment of James. Thus we get the picture of a man who was very committed to Judaism and the law, and also very committed to Jesus and the gospel. 
But just a bit of background on the Nazarites, since that is what James is thought to have been. In Numbers chapter 6, again the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and tell them, If a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he is to abstain from wine and strong drink. He must not drink vinegar made from wine or strong drink. And he must not drink any grape juice or eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation, he is not to eat anything that comes from the grapevine, not even the seeds or skins. For the entire period of his vow of, of separation, no razor shall pass over his head. He must be holy until the time of his separation to the Lord is complete. He must let the hair of his head grow long. Throughout the days of his separation to the Lord, he must not go near a dead body. Even if his father or mother or brother or sister should die, he is not to defile himself because the crown of consecration to his God is upon his head. Throughout the time of his separation, he is holy to the Lord. And the book of Numbers goes on with more about the Nazarites. And something else I found online, the word Nazarite is from the Hebrew term Nazir, meaning to concentrate, consecrate, and is derived from the Hebrew word root word Nazir, meaning to separate. The man or woman who took the Nazarite vow took an oath to separate himself or herself from the world, and even from close kinship affiliation, to serve only Yahweh, making the Nazarite totally holy unto Yahweh. Now, in the Old Testament, Samson was a Nazarite from birth, and we get the impression that John the Baptist was also. Most Nazarites, however, made the vow of their own will for a specific period of time only, e.g. six months or three years or whatever. It is thought that James dedicated most of his life to God as a Nazarite, as is also mentioned by Hegesippus. And although he would have done so purely as a means of consecrating himself to God, it would also have contributed to his standing among the Jewish people in general, clearly delineating him as a devout Jew of the highest order. So, is salvation by faith or by works the subject at hand? In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Paul writes, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. And these verses are preached on regularly in many churches. It is central to the Christian faith. In Romans chapter 4, he also writes, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, has discovered? If Abraham was indeed justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, the wages of the worker are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David proclaims the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Is this blessing only on the circumcised or also on the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited as righteousness. In what context was it credited? Was it after his circumcision or before? It was not after, but before. Or compare that with James. James writes, what good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith, but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? So too, faith by itself, if it is not complemented by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that God is one. Good for you. But even the demons believe that and shudder. O oh, foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is worthless? Was not our father Abraham justified by what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith was working with his actions, and his faith was perfected by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. 
as you can see, a man is justified by his deeds and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute justified by her actions when she welcomed the messengers and sent them off on another route? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And this definitely appears to be a major conflict. Martin Luther was a sincere Roman Catholic priest who did everything he could to be good enough and to be acceptable to God. One time while visiting Rome, he climbed the holy stairs on his knees as a way to God's favor. And as you can see in this picture here, this is something that is still done today. Those are the stairs that Luther climbed, and those are the stairs that people still go up on their knees to try and earn favor with God. But nothing seemed to help. He was always so very aware of his own sin and failure. He could never be good enough. He could never earn his salvation, despite his ongoing best efforts. Until, until he discovered Romans and Paul's exposition of salvation by faith in God's grace alone. It turned his life around completely as the weight of sin lifted from him. And he knew that through Jesus, he was made righteous and accepted by God. It revolutionized his life. And thus began the Reformation. And with that background, is it any wonder that he had trouble with James's claim that faith was not enough and good works were required? Hence his reference to it being an epistle of straw. Now, as is always the case with all the books of the Bible, there have been many theories as to when each of the respective letters of both James and Paul were written. Thus, that, but most commonly, James is thought to be the earliest of the New Testament epistles. And thus, while it may be thought that he was writing against Paul's teaching, anything of that in it could only be on the basis of what he had heard about it, as in second, third hand, um, not any sort of official contradiction of Paul's writings, because Paul hadn't written it yet. Thus also, James could be seen as writing to a mostly Jewish church and Paul to a mixed church with a large proportion of non-Jews. This would have colored their writing in different ways and should similarly also color our interpretation. By nature of all that had been built into them over the generations, many of the Pharisees who had embraced the way, as it was called, would have remained very realistic, legalistic and committed to upholding the law no matter what. Hence, we get the story in Acts chapter 15. And these are the ones that Paul was in conflict with, not with James. Now, Paul didn't have anything against the law. He still kept his Pharisaic respect and regard for it. For example, as we read in Romans 3.31, do we then nullify the law by this faith? By no means. Instead, we uphold the law. And where it says by no means there, that is the translation of a very emphatic term in the Greek, which in the Australian vernacular could be translated as no way. It's very strong. And in Romans 7.33, he writes, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But he was totally aware of the fact that as someone legalistically righteous, as he wrote in Philippians chapter three, to the extent even of persecuting the church, he nevertheless failed completely. And C.S. Lewis wrote, now we cannot discover our failure to keep God's law, except by trying our very hardest and then failing. Unless we really try, whatever we say, there will always be at the back of our minds the idea that if we try harder next time, we shall succeed in being completely good. Thus, in one sense, the road back to God is a road of moral effort, of trying harder and harder. But in another sense, it is not trying that is ever going to bring us home. All this trying leads us up to the moment, of the vital moment in which you turn to God and say, you must do this. I can't. Salvation is totally by God's grace through faith. I can't do it. Now, that brings us to the controversy regarding Christianity and Judaism. 
do you have to be a full Jew, as in natural or proselyte, with all that entails to be a Christian? And this was a very important question at that particular point, such that the first church council was called in Jerusalem, where they all came together to discuss this and hammer it out. By that time, James was effectively the head of the church, and the final conclusion and judgment of that council was by James. He was the one to sum it up, to proclaim and promote the conclusion of the council. And that conclusion effectively came down on the side of Paul and Barnabas and confirmed their position. And it was his, that is, James's decision that was adopted by all, including by Paul. Now, some in the Pharisee party still could not accept that, being convinced that 100% adherence to the entire law of Moses was essential to salvation. And it was against them that Paul railed in his letter to the Galatian churches. In Acts chapter 2, uh, Acts chapter 21, verses 17 to 26, it implies, again, agreement between Paul and James, just as Paul and James agreed at the council. And with regard to the Acts 21 story, it's interesting to compare that with Acts chapter 18 and verse 18 as well. And 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul refers to the risen Jesus appearing to James. And in Galatians 2, James, Peter and John approved and encouraged Paul and Barnabas in what they were doing and preaching. So Paul did not have a problem with James in that regard. They were in agreement. That being said, they probably had highly different personalities and different personalities do tend to say things and do things differently and there can be little issues that way. But personality issues and doctrinal issues are by no means related. The thing is, Paul and James were speaking into different situations with different emphases, different purpose, and a different aim. Just consider a few examples here. Proverbs 26 verses 4 and 5 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he become wise in his own eyes. In Galatians 6 verses 2 and 5 it says, Carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Each one should carry his own load. Or just even in modern English, a couple of proverbs. Many hands make light work. Too many cooks spoil the broth. Now, these are all contradictions. But we understand them. And we understand that both are right in their context. We don't have a problem with that. And so it's the same thing here. James was writing mostly to Jewish church, Paul to those with a large proportion of non-Jews, as mentioned earlier. James was not writing to people seeking salvation or interested in how to be saved, but to Christians, brothers, he said, where the context makes clear he means much more than just fellow Jews. What he was telling them was that they needed to live what they believe, that I've got my ticket to heaven, I can do what I like, just isn't good enough. Paul, on the other hand, is insisting that our ticket, so to speak, is fully paid for by Jesus, and there's nothing we can do to contribute to it. And in fact, to try to do so is to insult God, to insult Jesus. More than that, to regard our own efforts as essential to salvation is tantamount to throwing away our ticket to then try to buy our own. James 2.26 says, faith without works is dead. The faith is real. It is there. It is not denied. But without the follow-up action, it accomplishes nothing. You may be saved, but you will have nothing to show for your life. Now, both Paul and James use Abraham as a prime example of what they are talking about, as proof of their point. Abraham was very important to the Jews and in rabbinic thought, was often brought in to prove any point. Thus, usage by both Paul and James reflects common usage and most likely does not imply that either were trying to use Abraham to in any way contradict the reference to Abraham by the other. And with regard to Abraham offering his son Isaac, as was quoted in the passage in James, Philo calls this offering of Isaac the greatest of Abraham's works. And 
1 Maccabees 2.52 links Abraham's faithfulness in the test to the pronouncement of Genesis 15.6 that it was reckoned to him as righteousness. James argues that Abraham's willingness to kill his son in obedience to the Lord's command is evidence of the works on the basis of which Abraham was justified. Though that being said, as Paul would point out, that reference in 1 Maccabees was contrary to, contrary to that reference in 1 Maccabees, the quote from Genesis chapter 5, verse 6 was from before Isaac's birth, and so obviously from before that sacrifice of Isaac. According to Paul, Abraham was declared righteous before Moses and thus before the law. James, by using Abraham, implicitly assumes the same thing. Thus, from both of them, what Abraham did was important, but keeping the law was another matter entirely. Ah. In Deuteronomy 6.25, says, if we are careful to observe every one of these commandments before the Lord our God, just as he has commanded us, then that will be our righteousness. But as Paul pointed out, one, no one can do everything perfectly. And James implied as much also. And two, Abraham was declared righteous before the law was even given, and thus not by obeying the law. When James speaks of Abraham and his works, it is not the law he has in mind or any system of legalism, but rather the tree and fruit facts of life. If you are an apple tree, you must bear apples. And we can compare that to Jesus' words when he said, by their fruits, you will know them. Abraham proved he was an apple tree, so to speak, by bearing apples. Without that, he was just a tree. And he proved that he was justified by faith, by what he then did. According to Paul, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And James says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And James again says, works implies faith. Your works imply faith. Romans 6 says more or less the same thing. Thus, both Paul and James are addressing a wrong view of faith and grace, but from slightly different angles. According to Paul, nothing you can do can make you right with God. But then James says, if you are right with God, your actions will show it. And James, if you, are tru if you truly had faith, your life would show it. And Paul, since you have faith, your life must show it. And Paul again, Abraham was not made acceptable to God or righteous by what he did. And James says, Abraham demonstrated and proved his relationship with God by what he did. Paul wants to make clear that no one gets into God's kingdom only by the, the, no, that Paul wants to make clear that one gets into God's kingdom only by faith. James insists that God requires works from those who are in. In 2 Thessalonians 1:11, uh, Paul writes or talks about your every good desire and work of faith, which sounds a little bit like what James would say. And earlier I quoted Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Let's read it again and throw in verse 10 as well. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance as our way of life. Faith is more than just believing. Faith involves and includes action in response to that belief. If it doesn't, then it is not faith. And that is James's point. Paul would totally concur, and it is that real faith that he is talking about. Though having said that, the waters are muddied somewhat by interpretations of Calvin that lead some to go into extreme lengths to avoid anything that, to them, suggests the doing of any works to earn salvation or earn God's favour. Paul says that no one can restore him or herself to full relationship with God by following a system of rules or laws. It is only God can do it. 
and he has done all that is needed. All that is left for us to do is to gratefully accept that. In other words, by faith. Both James and Paul then go on. Having been saved, reconciled, restored and made right with God, it is now incumbent on us to live accordingly, to reflect in our lives our new status in God. And in fact, that should be the normal state of those who, by faith, are now, as Paul put it, in Christ. Faith without works is dead, says James. And Paul effectively says works without faith is pointless, ineffectual, and powerless. And both of them, faith worked out, is life and power. And I like this little quote from C.S. Lewis. Regarding the debate about faith and works, it is like asking which blade in a pair of scissors is most important. So in conclusion, James's efforts are about having a go at those Christians who don't feel the need to live what they claim to believe. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul gives the picture of the end result for such people when he writes, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay or straw, his workmanship will be evident because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will prove the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one being snatched from the fire. Consider the famous claim that the church is full of hypocrites. And this is truly a reflection of what both Paul and James are getting at. Many are put off Christianity because of the lives of those who don't live what they claim to believe. On the other hand, many are drawn to also believe by observing those Christians who truly do live what they proclaim. The only way to be justified, completely innocent, is to live a perfect, sinless life. One sin, as both Paul and James point out, is enough to end that and make us guilty. But all of us have sinned. And as Paul emphasizes, there is absolutely nothing we can do to change that fact, to undo what has been done. And so we are totally dependent on God's grace for our salvation. That is grace, not forbearance or overlooking or misforgiving or anything else like that. Those things still leave the fact of our guilt in place. But his taking the full penalty on himself in Jesus such that when it is paid in full, there is nothing left to charge to our account. And we are thus declared righteous, justified. And by faith, we then receive that. But as James points out, if we truly do believe that and receive it by faith, it will affect how we live. We leave the final word here to Martin Luther. And his opinion of uh, James changed a bit over the course of his life. Oh, it is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. It is impossible for it to not be doing good things incessantly. It does not ask what good works are to be done. But before the question is asked, it has already done this and is constantly doing them. Whoever does not do such works, however, is an unbeliever. He gropes and looks around for faith and good works, but knows neither what faith is nor what good works are. Yet he talks and talks with many words about faith and good works. Thank you, and I'll hand back to you, Jeff. Okay, well, thank you very much, Brian, for that, uh, that uh, very substantial address on that subject. Um, I think that's given us all plenty of food for thought, and uh, I know that there were some comments made on the chat screen uh, perhaps we should look at those first um, before we before we uh, open it up to everybody um, for discussion, or maybe people can feel open to discussing this as we go through these chat comments. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, um, might be helpful if I shared screen and showed the chat. Uh, for okay. The, um, uh, let's see. Share. So I'll actually push the chat 
so that everybody on YouTube can actually see uh, what they're saying. Okay. So we can ignore the first comment, but the second one uh, is by me. <laughs> oh, I, can't, I can't see your questions. You can't see it? No. no we, you can't see we've got. Screen. I think you are sharing the wrong screen. Yeah. Am I? Yeah. Uh, I'll try sharing it again. Well, there's not a lot there. I can easily no, read out reading. the comments. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see it now? No. Uh, Let's do your browser not. window with chat GPT. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. Can you see the chat have... GPT? Yes. All right. So I'll actually put the uh, question into chat GPT. So I uh, thought it would make it interesting tonight in the discussion because uh, Tom Daly is going to um, uh, talk on chat you have a session devoted to chat to GTP. But in the meantime, I thought it might just to uh, get people's interest, just demonstrate it a little bit. And because uh, I uh, use properly, I think it's a bit of a game changer. So here the question the is down the bottom, who was Jesus, the brother of the Lord? Well, so let's just see what it says. Well, I think that was meant to be who was James, the brother of the Lord, isn't it? No, no, no. Oh, so yeah, you're right. You, uh, the, Right. Yeah, that's and who's, who's R anyway? Who's that? RF. Oh. Reasonable faith, also known as Kevin. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's your question. All right. Uh, Sorry. I'm learning this as I go. Uh, let's see. I think this is smart enough to um, uh, pick up. Yeah, it created your question. Yeah, it, it reinterpreted my question. It was pretty clever. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it got here the phrase the brother of the Lord appears in Galatians 1 19 where the apostle Paul was referring to James the leader of the church in Jerusalem the exact relationship between James and Jesus is a matter of debate among scholars and there are different interpretations of what the phrase brother of the Lord means some scholars argue that brother in this context may have referred to a close family relationship or a spiritual relationship rather than a biological sibling relationship Others suggest that James could have been a half-brother or cousin of Jesus. The Catholic Church and some Orthodox churches teach the doctrine of perpetual virginity of Mary, which asserts that Mary remained a virgin throughout her life, and therefore James and other individuals referred to as the brothers of Jesus in the New Testament were not his biological siblings, but rather his cousins or close relatives. The Protestant mm. tradition generally holds that to the belief that Mary had other children after the birth of Jesus, including James. However, the exact nature of James' relationship to Jesus remains a matter of debate and interpretation. So congratulations, Brian. I think that, that actually um, uh, is in agreement with what you presented. Yeah. So chat GPT got that one pretty right. <laughs> yeah. Do, does anyone know when the virginity of Mary was first promulgated? Was it, you know, one of the later popes who suddenly made up his mind that that was true? Because well, we find we're happy we asked Chat GPT. Yeah, we find oh. no reference to it. When in was the oh. 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 perpetual? Oh. While you're doing that, can I make the point? I yeah. thought Brian's um, uh, point about the Nazarene element about James being a Nazarite, I thought that was very interesting in the sense that Jesus was known as um coming from nazarene yeah yeah nazarene and nazarite are very yeah. similar sounding words but they mean something totally different they oh, are different okay. yeah jesus oh, was do. a, a nazarite yeah because he was from nazareth uh, he wasn't a nazarite as in the All old right. Testament. okay well that makes my um, yeah. point that, yeah. like, that right. okay. this is uh, this is a, the question that somebody asked when was the perpetual virginity of mary first proposed Let's see what happened. I've got no idea what it's going to say. Might be a difficult no. one for it. <laughs> oh, dear. Just thinking about it. Yeah. About, mm. Within the... <laughs> within the what? <laughs> Christian church. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It is very early. It goes way back. Um, In other words, it looks like the chat doesn't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. Because uh, I, I think, with regard, I've looked into this myself, and 
I think that this interpretation of those scriptures, uh, it is possible, um, but it's a bit forced. Um, so the, the most uh, obvious reading of the uh, Bible passages is that um, Mary and uh, Joseph had other children um, between them after Jesus was born. Um, but um, and the Catholic and Orthodox churches have other reasons why they want to um, um, have this have this belief. It's not necessary coming out of those Bible passages. Yeah, you will hear it saying saying that um, it kind of got entrenched in the Council of Chalcedon in four fifty one AD. Yeah. But as I originally said, nowhere in the New Testament uh, writings, uh, apart, I think, from the early book of Acts, do we hear about Mary. After that, she just disappears. It's yeah. as though she's been promoted, you know, over the, over the next few centuries, but uh, certainly no reference to it in the writings we have of, uh, as we, as the New Testament we know. Yes, yeah. very much a church tradition. Yeah. Uh, others, other critics of the Catholic and Orthodox churches and their stand would say that, well, they did this because uh, it countered the um, male-dominated hierarchy in those churches, you know. Okay. So they gave a particularly high position to Mary uh, to counter what was otherwise a very male-dominated uh, hierarchy. And, and, of course, it then goes on to say, uh, if you can't get onto Mary because she's too busy on the phone, answering uh, all the questions, then, then you turn to Anne, her mother. Mm. Yeah, I've always been puzzled why someone sort of refers to um, praying to a saint rather than Jesus. Oh, yeah. I even had a friend say that to me when she was overseas and mm. she was in somewhere in Europe near some, mon some monastery where some saint, some woman had seen Jesus or something, or seen, uh, had been healed some vision and she was sainted you know and they said that she said i'll pray to the saint for you i'm like it's just bizarre you know it's yeah it's superstitious. yeah well i'd have to say i read greg sheridan's book a while ago he wrote two books um quite um recently um justifying uh, the christian faith and uh, the belief in you know, the christian faith is good for you and this i can't remember the exact titles of his books um, but they were both very good. And, of course, he's quite an ardent Catholic and he justifies the uh, praying to Mary. But really it's on the basis of, well, he likes the idea, really. That's really it. Uh, there's not much other justification for it. I've had a long discussion with some Catholics one time uh, in a situation where we could have a free and open discussion without anybody getting their hackles up or anything like that. And one of the questions that was then asked back to me was, well, we seem to think it's okay to ask somebody else to pray for us. Um, we yeah. seem to think it's okay for us to pray for other people. So why wouldn't the saints want to pray for us? Yeah, yeah. yeah but, not, not, yeah. That, not that I think that's a good enough answer, but it does kind of make sense if you look at it from that perspective. Yeah. I'd have to say, too, with regard to Greg Sheridan's books, I otherwise did find them both very good books. And, um, and in some regards, it did give me more appreciation than I've had before of uh, the Catholic faith, but I couldn't agree with that one about praying to Mary, and he quite, it goes to quite some length to justify it. I would like to get more Catholics involved in what we do, <laughs> but it's been very hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we did have this debate with our Orthodox friends about three yeah. or four years ago. Hmm. Anyway, probably a little bit off topic. Yeah, we are. <laughs> All right. Do you want me to get you back on topic? Mm. Uh, okay. What oh. a, a, a back up what else is... topic of chat GPT. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, should we look at the questions other people asked in the chat there? Right. Let, let's yeah, yeah. see what um, uh, Where's the chat? chat GTP says about... Um, yeah. Oh, where's the chat? Where's the uh, chat, Kevin? Where's the live chat tonight, Kevin? Oh, I, I, I'll show you. Yeah. Yeah, but nobody uh, can see it, Kevin. No, it's not it. No, it's not. The well, questions that people asked in the chat online while I was speaking is what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, can't people access it themselves oh, yeah, on their own screen? Yeah, we can see it yeah. ourselves. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Well, why don't we keep going through it? We've dealt yeah. with the first one. The second one was from Bronwyn. The yeah. Gospel of John speaks of Jesus saying, John three sixteen. I don't know what what is uh, what do you mean by that, Bronwyn? What's the point there? Oh, um, I think it was in a reference to grace um, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him. So, I yeah. suppose it, yeah, it was that Jesus Himself was saying, "Whoever believes." Um, right, yeah. As being, yeah. yeah, as being the foundation of of faith. Yeah. I suppose that was yes. the point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's very mm. Would you want to move on to the next comment then, uh, Jeff? Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, the next one, uh, leave aside Tom's because that was just a note about where he is. Uh, from Stephen then, uh, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 By grace you have been saved, not by works, is then followed by verse 10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. I think Stephen's there showing uh, how this um, kind of dichotomy, uh, uh, mm. the, the two things are right there in the uh, in the writings of Paul, which is, I agree, they are, you know. And if he'd uh, waited a little bit longer, he would have heard me say all of that. And exactly. Please read my next comment. Please read my next comment. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Brian just stated verses eight to ten in an, in a later slide, so go on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's very very uh, inherent in Brian's whole uh, address, um, and I think Brian, you explained it pretty well. <clears throat> yeah, Thank yeah, you. it was very good. I find it really intriguing that Paul, um, well, the way you presented Paul, having all before he was converted must have had an appreciation of grace like um because he was talking ref referring to um well paul would have known the bible so well right yep. um and he knew that god said um that abraham was justified not uh, by by his uh, what, obedience was it or faith yeah um not he's declared righteous faith, faith. Faith. Yeah, faith. yeah so Paul had a, yeah, he even, he had an appreciation of the fact that despite yeah. the legalistic uh, manner in which he would have lived his life, it was all down to God's grace. Mm -hmm. Yet mm -hmm. we consider him to have been just, I would have thought of him being legalistic completely without having any grace in his concept, but he must have had that appreciation somewhere mixed up in there. Mm. I'm not sure I, mean, I you know, agree with you, Bronwyn. I, I think he would have actually known the scriptures. Uh, yeah. but when he was converted, he saw, he interpreted them in a different light. He did, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he probably would have been wrestling with that, I suppose. About he did he... say about his former life that as touching the law, he was blameless. So he yeah, felt like he'd right, done everything yeah. right. But surely he couldn't have, you know, surely he must have slipped up, even have, no matter how dedicated he was and how, how well he knew uh, all the intricate laws and everything uh, he must have known that well at some point he slipped up yes. basically he explained that blameless bit uh, somewhere in one of his letters as effectively being that nobody watching him would be able to accuse him of doing anything wrong there was nothing that anybody could pick up in what he did um, right. and yet also if you read through his letters you can tell that inside he knew that he wasn't good enough that uh, even such blamelessness uh, was not enough. Yeah, yeah. and then you just you just have to read the road to Damascus experience that he he went through to realise what grace was poured yes. out on him, and then Ananias, you know, a few days later, and on the street named Straight in Damascus comes to him and, and commissions him, and uh, the grace that Paul must have felt as he was called um, certainly yeah. was a very very powerful revelation to him that grace was abounding in his life. Yeah. Mm. Hey, John, um, just unmute yourself so you can talk. Yeah. Right. Yeah, just in case you want to talk. Yeah. Oh, good day, John. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, good. Hi, Jeff. Yeah. Did you have any comments or questions, John? Not really. No, it's um, pretty straightforward. It's sort of left to right and right to left sort of thing, but uh, yeah. Um, 
I like that topic on legalism is something that even as a society or church, um, we always seem to fall into. It's one yes. of the hardest things. Uh, Derek Prince, uh, I've mentioned him before, but he says that legalism is the hardest thing to kill in the old man. We keep falling back to it. It's like our fallback position. We um, just, even at church, it's like, unless we'd worship the Lord this way or we believe this or we preach this way or, you know, we wear these clothes or we eat this food or it just slips in there. And even yeah. in society, you'll notice that, you know, people have to be at the gym. You know, got to, at the moment, it's a real gym junkie thing. You know, everyone's got to be doing the gym, you know, um, or it could be certain diets that, you, that you're supposed to be on or um, yeah. society has it. You know, it seems to be in, innate in our in the, uh, the way we're made. Yeah, I think that's true. That that we all have a legalistic tendency, and that goes. There's always there in human society, but on the other hand, I do wonder whether today um, in Christian church widely, and uh, there isn't much expectation that we need to be obedient. You know, yeah. I, I think that's really downplayed these days. Yes. Um, that uh, we should uh, being we should you know be seeking to know what God's uh, laws and um, are about this that and everything else, and we should be seeking to obey them. Yes, it's quite true. We're not saved by we're not we're not right with God because of obeying the law. But nonetheless, um, as, as Brian's pointed out well enough, and has come out in. Uh, from all countless other um, Christian leaders through the centuries who have dis discussed this perennial topic, um, you know, there is an obedience expected of us. But it does seem to me that this is really downplayed these days in the church. Don't you think? Do, do, what no, other I, I think, think of okay. I, I feel that um, we, we can get a bit legalistic, but uh, the real thing is if we love God and love our fellow people and especially yeah. the christian household of faith then we we act out of obedience out of love and yeah. uh so it's not legalism at all it's it the whole holiness. horse and cart business uh, which one yeah. comes first um paul is well both of them i suppose are saying that we've got to get the horse in front salvation is purely by god's grace um and one of the reasons why legalism is so powerful is because pride is so powerful and it hurts our pride, damages our pride to think that there's nothing I can do myself towards my salvation, that I'm totally helpless. Uh, and so our pride tells us I've got to do something. I've got to earn something here. Um, yeah. But then again, we still have to have the cart. A uh, horse by itself isn't enough. Um, mm -hmm. We've got to have that cart behind. We've got to have the works that follow. And, but we do it because we are saved, because we are accepted, not in order to be accepted or in order to be saved. And so mm. we can do those works in humility rather than in pride. Mm -hmm. um, when I said, did, did my presentation on uh, Christian experience, like one of the things that uh, kind of popped to me is, uh, like Jesus said, uh, the, um, if, if somebody hears my words and puts them in a, my, into practice, uh, my, uh, my father will, will reveal, or I will reveal myself to him. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, to me, that said that basically, if you actually act on your faith, then the reality of your Christian experience will be so much more real. Yep. But if, if you're just kind of relying on faith and do as you like, then it will go dry on you. Mm -hmm. Kevin, we can't see your face. If, is that... I don't know why that is. Yeah, now yes. we can. You can now. <laughs> yeah. yeah you got, you got to look. you got to be oh, in front of the okay. camera. Uh, yeah, I we was actually, kind of leading off the side, so you can't see that I was drinking wine. Yeah. <laughs> we actually think it's better to see. It is actually better to see you, Kevin. Oh, yeah. really? <laughs> no, well, it's not coming up, up on my screen, so I, I presumed on my face it's not coming up on yours. But apparently oh, it is okay. now. Oh, we are. We're in the gallery view. Ah, okay. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Ah, yes, now I can see me. It's just my settings on the gallery. Yeah. Never been like this oh, before. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm. Any other comments, anybody? Mm. Um, I think I've mentioned this before, but 
um, considering we're living in a more and more culturally diverse country, I think as Christians, we have to be really aware that we have grace in our back pocket, uh, which just outweighs all the other religious doctrines. Yeah, yeah. And we have to remember it because it's what we should be having as front and centre when we, and, re, you know, remembering that when we're engaging in a conversation with other people from other faiths. Mm, yeah, that's right. Hmm. Yeah. Hey, just recently I read a book. Uh, look, I, it should be on the shelf behind me, so I'll just see if I can locate it. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is it. Um, a Doubter's Guide to World Religions by John Dixon, who is mm -hmm. a Christian writer. It's available through Kurong. It was only put out just last year, I think, and I've mm -hmm. read that. It covers the five major religions. And it's very readable um, and it's very fair presentation. So he's actually had, uh, I mean, he's written it all, but I think he's had it each section reviewed by people whom he would respect from each of those religions to make sure yeah. they're happy with what's presented. And uh, I mean, his view is that you don't need to put a spotlight on Christianity for Christianity to stand out. You know, he just says, well, a broadly tells what each religion's about, what the major divisions are, what the um, really significant issues are in that religion, as and so on. Um, and each one stands alone. It's, it's quite. It's a very good book. And in today's world, I think it's a very helpful book to, for yeah. the likes of us to be reading. Does it include atheism as one of the religions? No, it doesn't. It he he does have some discussion at the beginning about the choice of five, and he presents them in roughly chronological order. Um, although even there, that's a bit hard to say. So it covers uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, Judaism, Judaism uh, Christianity, and and Islam. Those five. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. He also used to put uh, secularism as one. As yeah. a one belief system too, because he said everyone believes in something. That's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> He's a very easy writer to read. Is he Australian? Yes. Yes. From Sydney. Oh, from Sydney. We won't hold that against him. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very good. Did you say Kevin Sydney Anglican? Is he? Yes. Yeah. He's living in America now. Is he? Oh, okay. Yeah, except for when he's not. Okay. Oh. Because he's living in America, except for when I'm not. That sort of thing. Well, this says on the back he lives with his family in Sydney. There you go. Yeah, well, that was when it was written. He's since moved to America to take up a position with you. Oh, okay, right. I can't remember what it was. Hmm. Yeah. I think he's gone to Wheaton College. Okay. Hmm. Illinois. Hmm. Right, you're hmm. telling me. All right. Mm. I've got another book of his which I haven't read yet. And I think it's um, Bullies and Saints. It's a bit of oh yes, that's a great uh, book. An overview of Christian church history. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and all. He's a really good historian and a good speaker, so he's well worth reading. Mm. Yeah. All right. Mm. Oh, you're, all right. you're managing this anyway, aren't you? I am supposed to be, yeah. So, all right, if, if nobody's got any further comment to make, um, we'll wrap tonight's um, presentation up there. But before we do end the recording, uh, perhaps, Kevin, you could just uh, let us all know uh, what the next um, address is and when, please. Uh, right, okay. In that case, I better look it up, hadn't I? Okay, sorry <laughs> to put you on the spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or does anybody remember off the top of their head? It's not me. I know that I'm down for a couple of months' time. Uh, okay. Uh, and I'll be speaking about up. Islam, the origins of Islam. Yeah, just oh, say, I'll, I'll look it up. Uh, um, RFA. Right, I can tell you now what it is. Oh, Good. it is what is the best Christian response to a convinced Muslim? And that's by Gordon Stanger. Oh, okay. Oh, he's jumping the gun on me, is he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, because uh, uh, because later you're on the 22nd of June, uh, Jeff yeah. is talking on the origins of Islam. That's right. 
Uh, is uh, that a new topic from uh, Gordon then? Was that on the list before? It was on the uh, list before, yeah. It, oh, okay, right. It Good. is. Yeah, but all right. Anyway, uh, that may be of limited interest to YouTube viewers. So uh, would you like me to stop the recording now, Jeff? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you, everybody. And for all those viewing later, I hope you enjoy this and the discussion. See you.